high resolution topography for active faulting and paleocyte modes, we already know how useful the LIDAR is, for example, for limb bone quality. This totally makes a difference, right? So let's, this uh, lecture talks about uh, using these kinds of new technologies to characterize the topography and also the stratigraphy from offsets. And so we, or from fault zones. So we have something called airborne laser scanning, and we can also have terrestrial laser scanning. And the uh, airborne laser scanning is really good for more like kind of hundreds of square meters to square kilometers. And the terrestrial laser scanning is maybe more for square meters for outcrops. And we can also characterize other features like precariously balanced rocks, some secondary structures that may be indicators of strong ground motion. But the key thing is this, this uh, caption says is the challenge is to put everything in the same coordinate system. So global XYZ, airborne laser scanning XYZ, terrestrial laser scanning XYZ. So a lot of the hard work is doing that, georeferencing. So first thing is airborne laser swap mapping or airborne laser scanning. What is it? What is that LIDAR? So the three parts are laser scanner, inertial navigation, and GPS. So it's in an airplane, and the laser scanner, they are very expensive instruments. Usually they cost maybe one million dollars to buy one. And then in the airplane, you know, the airplane is like hundred thousand dollars. But then you use the you use it like so usually an individual institute won't have an airborne laser system, but a company will, and so they will charge for acquiring the data. And so you obviously can have it here in Indonesia. That plane came from Singapore. It, uh, here from Jakarta. Yeah, so companies are owning these technologies here. And so the scanner, is, it's a very powerful laser system. Usually it's flying 600 meters above the ground. And the laser, it's going back and forth, plus or minus 15 degrees. And it's shooting a pulse, uh, maybe... 100,000 times per second, so very fast pulsing. And then the second thing is the aircraft, you know, the plane is flying and maybe the wind is blowing, and so the plane is changing its orientation. So the inertial navigation gives the aircraft orientation because we need to know which way the laser is pointing in, as it's in the airplane. And then the last thing is we need to know where the airplane is, so it has kinematic GPS. So when you put all these three together, it's, you know, it's sampling the ground about every 15, or the spot size gives us a range to the aircraft of about, of, with a sampling of about 10 or 20 centimeters. But we can come up with an absolutely positioned laser return because the, if everything works in global coordinate system, so because of GPS positioning. And so in detail, this is what happens, and this is what we'll play with this afternoon, is that the outgoing laser pulse is a single, uh, like a Gaussian pulse with time and energy, but it goes and it may interact with the vegetation, and so the, the returns are from the top of the canopy and from the ground, okay? And so often in the instrument itself, it will sample these and it will pick the leading edge of these signals and identify them as, as the return. So it's just the range, basically. So from the range measurements, we get a point cloud. So the point cloud is X, Y, Z, and the laser intensity for every return. So many, 100,000 per second, right? You can get millions in no time, and billions in no time. But we get, this is the, the power of it, and this is what I'll try to have us play with this afternoon, is the point cloud. We've already seen the gridded products, which are the digital terrain model and the digi digital surface model. But really, the, the uh, LiDAR data are first giving us the point cloud, X, Y, Z position. And then we filter those data to identify ground versus structure and vegetation. And so when we, can, we do that, and we can pull the, the the uh, digital surface model, we can pull the vegetation away. We, we have the digital train model. In this case, we can see our nice fault traces. 
So here's an example of what this does. These are individual trees. You see this tree right here. And this is the, the same view in the LiDAR point cloud showing the, the returns from the top of the tree. And so you see the number, or the color shows the return number. So yellow is the early returns from the laser pulse. And then as we go through the tree, we may get some more returns. So blue and red going down, and then some second returns under the tree. So this is the same tree, and ecologists can use the LIDAR to tell what, what the species type of the tree is. So it's extremely powerful for forestry. And so here you see this different shaped tree, a different shape of the top, and it's a different height. Here's another tree, different shape, different penetration, which gets a little denser, so we don't get as many returns in the interior of the tree. And then here's another dense tree, different shape, different height. So the uh, ecologists really love the LIDAR also. And usually as geologists, we throw away the vegetation but the geologists or the ecologists throw away the ground, so we can use the data together. So one thing that we have done in North America is uh, have scanned many active faults in Western North America with laser scanning, and these data are freely available. So one site we'll look at this afternoon is a project that I'm involved with called Open Topography, and so there you can go and get your own data to study, play with, and uh, it's an example. So someday maybe we can put some Indonesian lighter data in here. When you're ready to give it away, when you're done studying. Because this is our culture, is just to make it as available as possible. Everyone can just use it then. Uh, but of course we have to respect people need to do the research from them first. So then, so I'll show some examples from like the Denali rupture. We have some Carrizo Plain, North Coast. Uh, all these different places I'll show examples. So here's one. This is a, the ocean. This is from the Pacific, from Northern California here. So, so the ocean is, is down here. And you see this is the digital surface model. Lots of trees. There's a road here. We can take the trees away and we see under the trees and you see this, uh, line that's the San Andreas Fault. The other thing you can see the, is these artifacts. You see these triangles. These are uh, showing that there's poor laser penetration through the vegetation. And so we, we don't have good representation of the digital terrain model in those places. So the triangles are from the interpolation to make the digital terrain model. And that's an artifact that sometimes people say, oh, it looks so ugly. It's something wrong, but actually it's useful for us because we know, okay, the data quality is not so good there. But these are older data. This is uh, from 2003, so 10-year-old data. And at that time, the instrument was a LiDAR system had about 20,000 shots per second. But now it almost could be 10 times higher, 100 or 200,000 pulses per second. And some aircraft, they'll fly two laser scanners on the same plane to really increase penetration. So we don't see these kind of artifacts as much now for research for high quality LIDAR. But sometimes the commercial companies, they'll say, oh yeah, I'll give you some data cheap, but then it's lower quality. They may fly the plane much higher and so they can go faster. But then when you look, you can be disappointed. So it's very important if you do engage the companies to really challenge them on the acquisition characteristics and the shot density on the ground. And uh, we'll discuss this more after lunch. So there's fault, and we can subtract one surface from the other to get the canopy height. So this is the height of the vegetation. And so these are data in feet, because these are old data, but 300 feet is 100 meters. So these trees are 100 meters tall in this valley. So you see the value for the ecology or for the forest tree people. So here's another example. This is Google Earth. We've already shown this some for Lembong, so I'm going to go fast. There's the same place in a digital terrain model. So you can really see under the trees. Here are these fault scarps. 
And then here you see a person in the car. So these are the redwoods. So these big uh, trees, very dense, and but still good penetration through the redwoods. So questions? Okay, so I'm looking. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about why we need the LIDAR. And we now already know, but we need to see at the appropriate scale. So here's an example. The San Andreas Fault is in this picture, and this is a hill shade, but it's a 10 meter perpetual hill shade. So you don't see anything, right? So you may, they all are about he doesn't know what he's doing, he chose some wrong place. But really, uh, it's, this is what the place looks like in the LIDAR. And so what this shows is that these, these yellow dots are the actual laser returns on the ground, point cloud. And so this now, and then I made a digital, actually this is a digital surface model, but there's not much vegetation, so I leave it in, 25 centimeters per pixel. And so I can see this offset stream channel quite well. And so this place, you see these guys are standing right here, and I'm taking this picture looking this direction. And this histogram shows the number of points per square meter. So this particular data set has about four shots per square meter. So you can take this table, maybe as a meter and a half, we'd have six returns on the table. So it gives us really rich sampling of the ground. And so my point is here, for example, if you want to see a, a small earthquake, like a 6.5, maybe it has 20 centimeters of offset, you can't use a 10 meter digital elevation model to see a 6.5 earthquake. It's just impossible. So you need to have something fine. Even this is a little bit too coarse for the 6.5. Maybe we need a terrestrial laser scanner, but we can see a magnitude 7 with these data. Questions so far? Okay, so then for the geomorphology, the tectonic geomorphology, we really need the uh, high resolution topography, so meter per pixel because here, if you remember my lecture on geomorphology, we see this hill slope and fluvial transition zone. So the, the yellow is the tips of the drainage network. It's a very sensitive part of the landscape to all kinds of things, climate change, to uplift. And we can only see it when we are, have our sensitive uh, measurement of it from the high resolution topography. So this would be the one meter view of this. Here is the 10 meter data, it's very lumpy because it's too coarse to study that. And here you see the same place with the students in the, the channel. And so you see they're one and a half meters tall. So there's a lot of structure to the landscape at that fine scale. So only can be studied with the LIDAR topography. So we can do airborne laser scanning or we can use terrestrial laser scanner. So this is a terrestrial laser scanner studying a precariously balanced rock. So one time, some thing, and we'll discuss this when we do paleo intensity, is that the precariously balanced rock, that rock's in there. If there's a big earthquake, it should be knocked over, right? There's no way it can stay here. So it, what we say is negative indicator of strong ground motion. So it's because it's there, there hasn't been a big earthquake. How long, we don't know, but that's what we try to date these things. So one of my students, he worked on the geometry of these precariously balanced rocks with the laser scanner. So this is a, the good machines a lot of times are the Regal. They're one of the more favorite terrestrial laser scanners. They're easy to operate, very durable, also somewhat expensive. So here's a view of the TLS uh, terrestrial laser scanner point cloud in a, in a valley, and you see some of the precariously balanced rocks but you can also see the problem with the terrestrial laser scanner is it has shadows because it's the light. We're just shining. So I can't see behind you guys if I'm shining from here, right? So I have, so the terrestrial laser scanner problem is, is acquisition because we're on the ground. But the sampling is so high, it can be 10 or 20,000 shots per square meter. So you, you can't see a single earthquake in the course data. And even, and, and so you have to go fine 
and maybe even finer than this to see a small earthquake. So uh, the, the best is to laser scan with terrestrial for maybe a single earthquake. Or now, because the new systems are, you know, these data, this V4 is 2005, so it's eight years old, and we are seeing uh, now shot densities are more like 10 to 20. So that means we can go even finer from the airplane. But this TLS, 20,000 shots per square meter, we can measure very small objects. So reconstructing flip history. So now I'm going to just apply this to offset stream channels, what, how we use these data to reconstruct earthquakes. So what we may want to do, and we talked about this, is, is we want to measure offset. So here is uh, this horizontal and vertical flip vector from an earthquake. So we can easily reconstruct the side of the stream channel to this person here. Here's a 3D trenching. There's a little channel fill that goes across the fault and matches there. And so this is a little tiny three-dimensional excavation. Here's the geomorphology. The stream channel goes up and crosses the fault to these guys. And then here's a offset in the trench. So as we've said many times, the displacement is the fundamental measure of the earthquake. So how do you measure it if you aren't there? So this is one thing we've been doing in, with my students a lot is the interpretation of the LIDAR topography from the office. So it's important, I want to say right away, that of course I think going to the field is important and maybe more important. But sometimes it's expensive or you can't go everywhere. But we can fly the scanner along the fault zone and measure uh, the topography. And then we can identify streams like this one that are offset. And so in this case, we have some software we wrote that lets us take the, the red line and cut the profile like this. We have the fault, which is the light blue, and we have a second profile across the channel on the downstream side that's the blue profile. We identify the projections, so we know that sometimes the, the stream channels, they don't come perpendicular to the fault, but they may come obliquely. So that's what the yellow line does. It is it, it accounts for the projection. And then we can slide the two profiles in the computer past each other until we find the best fitting, the best match. And the best match then is our preferred offset. So that's what this shows here. Goodness of fit, nine meters, and then going down. So this approach, so you see Barrett, this is a, one of uh, Gayatri's fellow students, even from San Diego, but he's the master of this work. You see he has his coffee and uh, Sumatran coffee and three computer screens and he's going to work. He doesn't have his earphones in, I don't see, but he may have some music also. So then he would go and check in the field. So we one thing we also do is look at the quality. How good is this reconstruction of the offset? Is it so C was one of the leaders of this and so he Every time he made a measurement, he did these in the field, he would say, okay, this is really good. There's no doubt I can reconstruct it. Or this one's very poor. It's a suspected offset. And so then different people have sort of followed that slightly different ways of describing quality. But we always rate the quality as well as the uncertainty. And so one control on the quality of the offsets is something about the fault zone width and the obliquity. So if you have a, you know, a good case would be something like this where it's a high obliquity. So the, the, the stream channel comes in basically perpendicular to the fault and the fault is really narrow. So this is good quality, high and high. And then this would be bad quality. So it's a, a wide fault and a high obliquity. So it makes it much more difficult to interpret. So we are experimenting with this. At this uh, sort of quality control or offset study. So one example from Barrett from his master's thesis was to study the San Jacinto fault. And so he had many offsets, all these little uh, dots here show the location of the offsets. And so for each one, we have the distance along the fault, the position, the horizontal component of offset, 
horizontal uncertainty, and then we would have quality, and if there's vertical, so we built a database of these offset landforms. And we can compare the, the field measurements with the, the, the office measurements. And so you see a one-to-one -one line. Generally, we're getting pretty good agreement between the field observations and the office. So that's good to see. It's not perfect. And you can't say that the field is always right. Sometimes the office might be better because you can be on top of the offset, whereas in the field there's trees. And But we usually uh, have high confidence in field observations. So we want to see both if we can. So then we can take these these offset and plot them with distance. I already showed this, remember, yesterday when I talked about, or the other day when I talked about characteristic earthquakes, we have offset versus distance, and we can do this along fault averaging and try to identify, well, what is our signal? So this is a long fault averaging and also a long offset averaging. And so you see there's a big peak here, about two, two meters, maybe two to three, in this way of analyzing the data. And here, so then when we do this cumulative offset, we stack it. I talked about the stacking. Uh, you see very well this nice peak at three meters. So this noise here seems to stack up well at three. But there's a second peak at six. So remember the characteristic earthquake I I idea that the slip prevent is repeating. So at least here there's three and then six, so two three meter offsets on this piece of fault, which is 60 kilometers long. So here we tried some more ways of analyzing those data. So this is a 10 kilometer window size, so it's really picking up these individual points, averaging them there. And we tried color, so it's, these are just experimenting, what do you do with with these offset measurements to try to uh, have a summary of it. There's some kind of con uh, signal strength. And so very clearly you can say in this 70 to 80 kilometer distance is a good two and a half to three meter offset. And then here's maybe a little bit higher. So this is how we start to reconstruct the paleo earthquake uh, in our offset records. Here's that six meter group here and then the white would say there's no signal. So this was from Barrett's work where he interpreted as three big earthquakes that were basically characteristic. And then there was one partial rupture, small one here, that was historic. And so he knew something about it. It occurred in 1918. So we see this approach with other data sets. Here's the Zilke et al. cumulative offset probability with maybe uh, regular offset magnitudes. And here's the Klinger et al. that I showed before. So this work, we, we started to analyze all these offset groups along faults in California and um, build a uniform database of offsets. So it be the same thing for working here is to try to find confident offsets and accumulate them in the database so people can study them. So, okay. So, any questions on the offset story? Yeah. This one, the computer is, you know, it's a dumb computer. It's just averaging whatever is there, each cell. Whereas this is the smart geologist saying, okay, I know this is probably the last earthquake, and I have some other information that says that there was no cracking associated with that earthquake at that time. It's a good question, very observant. So let's go to earthquake displacement. So studying a single earthquake with the LIDAR. So here is just a really, uh, this was immediately after the Denali earthquake well, maybe two or three years after the the rupture zone was scanned. And so I gave, remember my first lecture, uh, the first day of lectures, I talked about the Denali earthquake, it's right lateral rupture. And so we see this left step, some positive features built here, initial on faulting, 
right lateral offset of this ridge line here. Uh, so this is bigger than crank magnitude 7.8. So these are five or so meters of offset, uh, but well preserved in the landscape and then well uh, archived in the laser scanner survey. So here's another one. This is the El Mayor Cucupa earthquake from 2010. And so this is uh, San Diego, so Southern California, Northern Mexico. Here's the uh, entire rupture. So we were able, I was working with this scientist, Mike Oskin, and we wrote a proposal to get the laser scanner for the whole rupture. And so about four months after the earthquake, we went, the plane went there and it scanned the, the whole rupture. So it was a big survey, and we could see the ground fracturing in the, the scan. And you see, so the illumination is from the right. So these are east-facing scarps. But then you come in here, you can see the dark. These are west-facing scarps. It's a little graben right here. Very nice. Here's the pictures on the ground from the earthquake. So that Gayatri and, and her research group in San Diego, they went and they studied this earthquake in the field. Here's that fault scarf that formed. Here I showed this picture before. These guys are standing on the, the rupture. So here's something we did which was quite exciting. Is we took There was a laser scan of the region from 2006 by the Mexican government. They laser scanned the region for mapping. And then... The earthquake occurred, and then we scanned it again, and so we could do LIDAR differences, so subtracting the before from the after. And so in this case, the color is the difference in the topography, not the topography itself. And so you, if I cut a profile across the difference, you can see this vertical offset, this, this scarf, but we also can see this warping next to the fault. So it's really... Uh, in my view, a very exciting opportunity that it uh, gives you a very quantitative measure of the deformation along the fault zone uh, from differential LIDAR. And so we've, we've continued to do this, and I may have mentioned this before, but we started doing it in Japan because the early, the before LIDAR in Japan is high quality, and but we're waiting now with all of these laser scans in California, Lembang fault we have, right? When there's an earthquake, you want to rescan it, and then you can difference them, and you'll get a really important view of the, what happened in the earthquake. So here's uh, some more of, of this this work. This is the same area. This fault zone is the one I just showed you right here, just tipped on its side with more profiles. And so you can see with the this is, again, the the difference between the two scans. And so this area shows subsidence and the faulting, but some down warping. And then we go across, there's a, a, a second fault right here. We see it pick up. So very interesting view of the faulting in the earthquake as well as the deformation, the warping around the fault, which is almost impossible for the geologist to see the warping. Um, and so here's XX prime, we can see, and what you see the, the spray of dots here is this swap. So we, 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 we measure across the map, we may take 50 meter wide, uh, swath of data. So along this line, some width. And so that shows the kind of noise in the landscape. But the middle line of that is the, the representative displacement or difference between the two scans. So we go across this fault here. But then what's interesting is in this area, it's warped. It's like the ground was bent in the earthquake along with the faulting. And so we actually did some uh, Coulomb modeling shown here to try to explore this, this warping behavior. And it was consistent with kind of an elastic Draining around the fault in the earthquake. So, uh, quite interesting result from this kind of very early light of differences. So, this paper just was published last year. 
which is the LIDAR difference thing from airborne data. So last year also we wrote a paper with postdoc and students and me and another one of the professors in our group because the earlier work, this work here is just with the di this digital terrain model, subtracting one terrain model from the other. But as I said before, the point clouds are what we really are interested in trying to different. And so in this case, uh, my colleague, Sara Pali, he's an engineer, and so he knows about methods which are point cloud matching. Like, if you have one cloud of measurements of this cup, and I move it, and I measure it again, can I find the cup in the cloud and compute the difference between them? And so the approach is called iterative closest point. And so you see the red would be, uh, let's say, before, and uh, the blue is after. And so progressively, you look for the closest points, and then you move them closer, 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 until they match. And so this is very computationally intensive, but you can, you know, if, if my, my hand, if this was the, the same thing, this is before and this is after, but after it's over here, I can search around in the computer until it matches. And so then the, the displacement between the two is the, the, what I'm looking for is what's caused by the earthquake. And so here, we, we, and so this has, we've applied it on the Japanese earthquake and on the El Mayor, but this example we applied it synthetically. So we took this place was scanned by five passes with the li LIDAR. So they flew back and forth five times. And so you can see we, we, we took basically these data here. We separated three and two and we said, okay, well, Pretend like there was an earthquake between them. And so we put a synthetic fault in and we displaced the early three surveys and then we compared them with the, the undisplaced later two. But remember that they're only about half an hour apart, so they're just a plane going back and forth. So they're not exactly the same data, but then we artificially displaced them. And so this just shows the experiment showing that we can easily find the offset. So we put five meters in horizontal and two meter vertical and it's, it's perfect. And then here was another one, uh, also pretty good. Here's one where we made it a little bit finer. So you see the window is 100 meters versus 50. So, you know, am I matching my whole hand or am I just matching kind of like my two fingers? It turns out it works a little better if you have more data to represent that feature that you're trying to match. This bottom one, we made it more complicated where we put the tip of the fault here and we computed using Coulomb the displacement field, the vectors coming in and going out, and we applied that to the prior data and then we compared it with the post and we could we could find it. We could see the signal. So what we're waiting for now is some big earthquakes to really test. The last couple of parts of this high resolution topography and LIDAR uh, lecture, I'll just show very quickly some examples about erosion and sedimentation and volcanic applications. And this came up a little bit yesterday when we were talking, remember there was a discussion about fires and repeat LIDAR over forests that were burned. So in a way that's the same idea of differencing LIDAR scans. So one, one thing that we can do is, if you remember before I talked about the LIDAR point cloud differencing, we were matching the clouds and, you know, so I was doing this with my hand, so I was measuring the full three-dimensional vector between pieces of the topography and that vector would be due to an earthquake. But in some cases we have erosion and sedimentation, so the erosion sedimentation is just a vertical change. Obviously, erosion cuts down, sedimentation uh, increases the elevation. So there's no horizontal displacement of the topography. And so in this case, then, we, we can compute something that's called the DEM of difference. And so we just simply take the new digital elevation model and subtract from it the old one 
and then in down here would be called the DOD, the DEM of difference. And so there you can see that the red shows erosion and the blue shows deposition. So in this case, it's not an <coughs> earthquake or a fault zone, but it just shows the change in the river channel. And if you look, you can see maybe what's happening. Um, if we, we look a little bit here, there's this... Uh, this piece of the channel and it looks like it's moving a little bit and changing and so in as a matter of fact you can see uh, here on the DEM of difference there's a little bit of erosion a little bit of deposition so this channel has actually been moving to this direction because if you imagine you know you have the channel margin here and it ends up there then when I subtract this will be lower and then this maybe there's a little bit of sedimentation so we have erosion on, on this side and then sedimentation there. So this paired red and blue might show channel migration. Um, other things, there's some changes you can see up in this area. There's a, this, this uh, channel that was there has uh, maybe moved around a little bit in the, in the current time. And so we, we see some changes there. So, this basic DEM differencing is a way to quantify the changes mm -hmm. and you can see just in detail here this tiny little pixel, a few pixels showing the new, del new DEM minus the old one giving us that map of, of erosion and deposition on the channel edge. And so then there's a, you can basically integrate this so you can add up the, the change in each pixel which is kind of like a, a prism right it has a, a, a width and a length which is the pixel size times the height is a volume so if you add up all those volumes then we can do a volume change due to the erosion and sedimentation so that's what what this sediment budget shows is that uh, you kind of for each pixel how much was was uh, removing material or eroding and how much was accumulating and and it looks to me like there's more on the right side of zero so this area had some net increase in volume uh, in it between these two scans so really powerful way of characterizing geomorphic systems and could be used for uh, faulting purposes like I said if you just have some vertical differencing but but there we might also try to do full point cloud comparisons as I showed. So here's another example, this one's a very obvious one, is to just fly the LIDAR over a volcano every few days when the volcano is active and maybe study the growth of a dome. And so this was a survey, set of surveys done over Mount St. Helens, which is in western uh, United States, western North America, and it shows, this particular figure shows the the crater and there was an early dome from before but then in 2003 to 2004 this other dome grew and it was associated with steam explosions and some other small eruptions but the main thing was this this growth of the dome and the total change if you can see look at this is 120 meters so it's a big big change but what they did is they they flew fairly often and so this just shows the growth of the dome by repeat topographic survey from the LIDAR. And so what's really impressive to me, so you can see the dates, so September, October, November, so this actually mostly happens in the win fall and winter of 2014. No, this is uh, s uh, steam. steam or clouds. This stuff right here is clouds or like a fog, you know, some low clouds in the, the crater. And so they were getting reflections from the lighter that day. And other things, yes, yeah, so there you can see it. Other things are interesting is the growth, for example, this little landslide. Watch right down here, this guy. He wasn't there, and then boom, he fell down. So that's an interesting thing to see. Other things you can see that some, uh, well, let's go. Here's the main dome coming up through the floor of the, 
the caldera. I don't know if I can stop this. Let's try. Mass is pushing through the floor of the, the crater. And so as it pushes through, it first deforms the crater floor and then it comes out like the back of a turtle or something. So this requires that the top of the volcano isn't obscured in steam or ash or clouds. But if it's clear, then you just fly the airplane over the volcano every week and you can really quantify the change. So it's a very powerful way to monitor volcanoes. So I already showed this yesterday, so I won't really spend too much time on it, but the technology comparison versus the resolution and any questions about it. Main thing is that, uh, you know, you have different tools and you want to use them all together, but some will be more appropriate for certain questions than others. If you, you have one survey and then something happens and you survey it again, how much can, how easily can we detect that change? So the change detection for the GPS is very good because you just can measure the movement of the benchmark. The INSAR, remember this is the interferometric change between two radar images. Then ALSM, this is the differencing that I just was showing, subtracting DEMs or doing the point cloud comparisons. And then the same thing can be done with the terrestrial laser scanning. So you can't, it's not so fine, but changes of, of, you know, 10 centimeters for airborne. So this means that we can, for earthquake studies, we can, it has to be uh, large enough that it moves the ground more than about 10 centimeters to detect it by repeat laser scanning from the air. Okay, so then the other thing I was saying is I really invite you to go to the open topography site and just get some data and explore because it's the best way to learn about LiDAR. And as we discussed yesterday, sooner than later, someone's going to say, okay, here's some data, go for it, get to work, and you want to be ready to go. Ten years from now, you'll be ready. You know that you'll have enough data and be ready to share. But this gives an example of what to do. You know, we started our, pro the open topography is from about 2006. So in in seven years, it grew from just one or two surveys to now there's 120 surveys. And we went from a few hundred million points to almost a trillion points. So, you know, hundreds of billions. So we went up by almost an order of magnitude in the holdings. So it, once you start it, then it gets some momentum because once people can trust it and they also see it's useful, then they say, okay, yeah, let's just keep just keep using it. So it's an example for, for the future. Okay, so that, so just in summary, the LIDAR provides this decimeter, so 10 centimeters to centimeter, global accurate measure of the Earth's surface. This meter scale is critical for structural and geomorphic studies. And the main applications we can discuss are, with respect to faulting, is, is fault zone mapping, reconstructing offsets, investing, investigating geomorphic responses to active deformation, which is one of the next lectures, and differencing of repeat surveys. And so looking ahead, uh, I think there'll be more and more data coming, just as we see here. You know, you have Limbong, uh, Mudrik was showing me something, the Sulawesi data set. So they, they're coming, you know, mining companies or maybe the, you know, big companies that have the money, they may be investing and they may want to share. Uh, if they have a big earthquake, probably you'll be able to get the data as part of the response. Uh, so then other things, you see it's a very rich data and you can do a human kind of driven interpretation, but we may also start looking for better computer processing of the data to filter it and start looking for semi-automatically for fault zone, faults. And so there's a paper, these papers are exploring, exploring like Fourier transform analysis, power spectral analysis of the data to look automatically for features. And I, you know, I think you, we need both. We need the human just, you know, looking, mapping, but also having the computer to help guide your eye. And so we think that this, this is a, uh, valuable not only for research but also for education so that's one of our other goals has been to make this available for students anywhere